It's certainly a joy and a delight to be with you today and to moderate um, this session. And that's because over the course of my adult life, I many times thought about becoming an organizer as a, as a career for myself. And I spent a couple of months um, on two different summers, two different summers looking at organizing and, and working as an organizer. And um, that got me very excited about this kind of work. It's work that takes political imagination, a thick skin, some solid chutzpah, a lot of courage, and by that I mean you have to be comfortable with tension and conflict. If you're not comfortable with tension and conflict, this is very difficult work to do. A genuine love of people, a, a, a relationality that is, uh, that it's part of, of the work of organizing. And you must have a certain security inside yourself and be willing to, to face your own vulnerabilities and, um, and to be comfortable with that, to be comfortable in your own skin. It's very, very demanding work. And one of the reasons I think of myself as somewhat of a, um, I wouldn't say an expert, but certainly knowledgeable about organizing is, as I mentioned, because of my own history, but also because I'm married to someone who's a professional organizer. So I walk the journey with this on a regular basis, and you'll, you'll meet him a little later um, this afternoon. Um, so today we have with us two individuals who have spent their professional lives living these various gifts that I just identified. Father John Bauman of PICO, and PICO is People Improving Communities Through Organizing, and Mr. Larry Gordon of the Industrial Areas Foundation, the IAF, and two theologians who will reflect on this work from their own vantage points, namely Dr. Catherine Corneal and myself. I'm excited about today and would love to say that this great idea for this symposium was my own. But in fact, that's not the case. Dr. Christopher Frechette of the School of Theology and Ministry is the individual behind um, today's gathering. It was his vision, his hard work, that brings us together this afternoon. In a conversation that we recently had, he reminded me of the ways in which two Jesuit insights are lived out in this work of organizing, namely finding God in all things and being a contemplative in action. The ministry of organizing creates solidarity across religious and ethnic difference. And in doing so, that's one of the ways it lives out these two values, finding God in all things and being a contemplative in action. Solidarity, that, it, that is the focus of this kind of work, is built through the creation of broad-based, diverse organizations. And they're diverse because they include churches, both Catholic and Protestant, Jewish synagogues, Muslim mosques. And they, and, and they bring together people from all of these um, religious traditions and, and others as well around values that they hold in common, values which are the fruit of their diverse faiths. These organizations create change. They create change for a more just world. My father loves um, sayings, dichos, and he has a saying that he always used to express in Spanish, and it's, del dicho al, trecho hay, del dicho al hecho hay un gran trecho, which means, some of you who recognize Spanish will know what that means, but basically it means that between the saying and the doing, there's a great ditch or a big gulf. And I share that today because broad-based organizations bridge this gulf. They truly are having, a, they, they, they work out of a vision, a political vision, and they bring it to a reality through their work. Um, it's truly a work of justice. Eduardo Galero once said, I don't believe in charity, I believe in solidarity. Charity is vertical, so it's humiliating. It goes from the top to the bottom. Solidarity is horizontal. It represents the other and learns from the other. I have a lot to learn from other people." Close quote. This ministry lives out the truth of this quote, of building solidarity. And one of Saul Alinsky's axioms, I think, is also important for our day today. The golden rule of organizing. Never do for someone else what they can do for themselves. Never do for someone else what they can do for themselves. That's, um, 
that, that, that's an axiom that, that, that I know guides the work of, of the speakers that we are going to be hearing from today. And I, most of us, I know in this room, are Roman Catholic, and we have a lot to be proud of in terms of the organizing work that's been done in this country as Roman Catholics. Because in 1970, the Catholic Church inaugurated the Campaign for Human Development. And the Campaign for Human Development was, um, the bishops called it their anti-poverty program in the United States. And uh, the, the Sunday right before Thanksgiving, they every year run a collection. And that money, they gather something like $9 million a year. And that money is, is used to fund organizing projects like the ones that we're going to hear about today. Um, so I, I think we have a lot to be proud of because in many ways, I know the IAF and I imagine PICO as well, um, got their start and really had a lot of foundation financially from the efforts of, of the Campaign for Human Development. Our goal for today is simple. We're going to engage the following question. How can faith-based community organizing, diversely constituted in terms of religious faith, ethnicity, and race, how does this inform our theological discourse and inform our practice of ministry? So today, I want us to begin with some table conversation. Let me, let me just give you a, a brief overview of how this afternoon will proceed. We're going to finish at 3.30. And um, the first half of, of our time together today, we're going to be hearing from Father John Bauman, from Mr. Larry Gordon. I'll introduce each of them um, right before they speak. And, um, and then we'll have some time for conversation. And then a break, a brief break. And then after the break, um, we will have reflections from myself and, and Dr. Catherine Corneal. And then we'll have some more time for conversation, and then we'll wrap it up and, and be finished at, uh, by 3.30 this afternoon. And as we begin, just to set the tone and to get us all into thinking about um, organizing in the work of justice as, as people of faith, I, I want to start us with a conversation at the tables. And so um, we'll just take a couple of minutes, and I'd like you to share with one another where, is your, where in your experience have you seen the value of solidarity practiced? So where in your experience have you seen the value of solidarity practiced? And secondly, what brings you to this symposium? Why are you here today? Why are you interested in this topic? So we'll take just about five minutes for you to introduce yourselves to one another at the tables and to share on those two questions. OK, I'd like to invite um, a, a couple of reflections from the tables. On, uh, on this notion of solidarity and your experience, and um, just so that we hear a little bit about what your conversation is. And we'll just take a couple of these, and then we'll move right into um, to the two presentations we're going to have um, from, from these two organizers. So who would like to share um, the discussion at their table about solidarity? My name is Sebastian Marike. Uh, graduate student of STMMA. Um, we shared uh, among us where solidarity could be found or experienced. And we took ourselves a little bit back home and also how other places could be touched in that regard. We thought of solidarity first. We began with the church. Uh, back home in Nigeria, in the Catholic Church, as well as some other Christians, we have some organizations inside. We talk of the CMO, the Catholic Men Organization. We are all men put together to help to see that the church functions well, together with the women, CWO, together with the youth, and also the children, the Holy Childhood Association. And everyone, each, each of them are very enthusiastic, putting their resources together, their time, their energy, and also their experiences and talents and gifts to make sure that they give the best to see that the church grows, the faith develops, and people find love in what they are doing. Then you see the same solidarity among the priests, the same solidarity 
with other organizations, apart from these major ones, like the pious societies, we have various of them, the Charismatic, the Bible Society, St. Anthony, it's all the list going on ending. Mm -hmm. Outside of it, we talked of the school, the institution. We talk of the teachers' association, where they put together their resources, their energy, their wisdom. They interact to get out the best and see how they can deliver and help the students perform better. Also, we see it among the students, too. Outside of the institution, we talk of the governmental sector, where you have the, the police, members of the house, senates, and other bodies, and the business sectors. So there are many parts where we have seen such okay, solidarity. Okay, so it's all kinds of ways that different groups are identifying with one another and one another's interests. Yeah. yeah and you see that in a number of different ways that they're yeah. woven together. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll take one more, and then and then I'll uh, we'll move on. If, and you just would you, if you'd share your name with us too, please. My name is Carlotta. Uh, we had a great uh, discussion here. Uh, we talked about the normal ways that we solidar you know, the solidarity in when natural disasters happen in different areas, and you know how we help other countries and other states and so forth. We also talked about how we welcome the, uh, refugees the, in solidarity with refugees, immigration reform, uh, gender, and so forth, how we work in solidarity with different uh, types of work, and human trafficking. Uh, we spoke about, you know, the religious women have done a fantastic job uh, with that, how we have a safe house, the only safe house in Massachusetts, oh, wow. where we have volunteers working with these women. So many, many ways, every day it happens. It happens in the neighborhood, you know, it happens in your workplace, um, and it's how do we, you know, be in solidarity with one another in different moments. Very good, thank you, thanks so much. And we're gonna certainly continue our discussion of this as we move forward. I know at my own table, there was some um, discussion about whether or not we really have uh, any long-lasting kinds of experiences of solidarity or if they're more fleeting kinds of experiences that happen in very intense moments. So I'm sure there's a lot of different ways of thinking about solidarity here. Um, I want to now turn our attention to uh, the contributions of uh, both uh, Father John Bauman and Mr. Larry Gordon. I want to introduce uh, Father Bauman, who is um, a Jesuit priest and is the founder of PICO, People Improving Communities Through Organizing. And, and PICO is a network of faith-based community organizations working to create innovative solutions to problems facing urban, suburban, and rural communities. Currently, he serves as director of special projects for PICO. Prior to the creation of PICO, Father Bauman was co-founder of a multi-ethnic and multi-racial community organization on Chicago's near west side. He received his professional training as a community organizer in Chicago at the Urban Training Center for Christian Mission and the Organization for a Better Austin. He holds a master's degree in theology from Santa Clara University and has been awarded honorary degrees, including the prestigious Doctor of Humane Letters from Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, and also from the University of San Francisco. He also received a degree in public service from Santa Clara University, and the Sister Margaret Cafferty Development of People Award from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. So we are really excited to have Father Bauman with us today. Please join me in welcoming Father Bauman. Thank you. It's great to be here uh, with you this afternoon to be able to share um, some of my thoughts. Um, I, I'm going to approach um, this whole question of looking at how my theology led me to get involved in faith-based organizing and then in turn, how faith-based organizing strengthened my theology. And I, I think the best way to approach this for me is that um, when I, I think about um, my theology, it did lead me to, um, to ministry, and I, and, and I think it's 
if I look at my journey, um, it's an interesting journey of how the two have interacted. I entered the uh, Jesuits in the uh, mid-1950s, and um, <clears throat> the, um, as, as many of you know in the Jesuits, we have a long period of formation. And um, so it, during that time, uh, we make our annual retreats. We're exposed very much to learning Ignatian spirituality through the spiritual exercises. <clears throat> and um, Nancy had mentioned um, how a, a very central to our spirituality is finding God in all things, and you know how God um, is so active in our lives and in our world. And it's also, as we contemplate on that, <clears throat> we look at um, how um, through our spirituality, um, Ignatian spirituality, the importance of uh, contemplation and action. And um, so that um, being of service to others and um, that whole notion of faith doing justice. So a big question for me um, as I was approaching theology was um, how can I do service to others? And there was uh, one of my professors had talked about uh, this program that Nancy mentioned, um, the Urban Training Center in Chicago. Uh, I did not know what I was getting into, but I, I wanted to do something. It was advertised as a program where you would be introduced to, as church people, um, doing ministry within the inner city. And at that uh, meeting, I met a person that, um, um, Saul Alinsky, um, who his message uh, really said something to me because it, it was so important, he felt, that uh, we recognize the importance of people in the communities and that um, listen to people and people come up with the great ideas and if we develop and pull people together um, that we can make, really make a difference in our community. And um, so the, um, um, so I, I had a, a field placement under um, one of his uh, lieutenants um, on the near west, on, on the west side of Chicago, and that's where um, it became a real life-changing experience for me. And so um, how community organizing then influenced my theology, I went, um, I had to go back to theology for my second year of theology, and theology really became alive for me at that point. Um, I began to wonder what happened during that first year of theology, but uh, it was amazing how um, that really influenced um, uh, my life and how theology became so concrete and, and uh, personal for me. And it was so much as I looked at uh, gospel values, um, you know, how the organizing was really putting those gospel values into action. You know, I, th I think of values of uh, uh, justice, um, integrity, love, hope, healing, compassion, service um, is, um, I, I thought, wow, this is what it's all about. So the, uh, during that, um, my second and third year theology, I um, at the same time was able to get involved with a local community, or, well, it was a sort of a community organization um, in the same area where we had our Theologate. And um, I also learned at that, I got involved while I was doing the theology, and I also learned at that time there's really a risk um, in being a contemplative in action or um, a, a, a faith that uh, promotes justice. The, just a, a very quick example, um, I, in being involved with this um, organization, the, there was a real problem with um, people that were um, 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 in, in like some of the ser uh, social service programs and uh, the supervisor in the area was um, cutting back on those programs. 
So, you know, I was involved with the group. I put my collar on. I was out. I was picketing. I thought, wow, you know, I'm, I'm out here with the people and we're moving this along. That evening, I get home um, to our, the safety of our Theologate where we were living. I get a phone call and it was my mother. And she said, John, um, I saw you on the news. And um, she said, I got a call from the super supervisor, uh, the county supervisor, and he told me, tell your son to have nothing to do with that group. And so it, that, it was an initial awakening that I experienced of um, expressing your values and, um, and relating the gospel values uh, to our work. My mother was great. She, she, she said to, I said, what did you say, Mom? And she said, I told him that um, if, if uh, my son was doing this, I believe he knew what he was doing, and I back him up. He's right on what he's doing. So I said, thanks, Mom. Great. <laughs> so, so then, um, so I finished my theology. I went um, um, uh, back to Chicago, and, and there, the, that was, there was a little bit of a disillusionment in my life because um, going, uh, um, this was right after Vatican II, the, uh, there were a lot of changes that were going on in the world, going on in the church, and I didn't have a good experience with church. I, I got ordained and I thought, wow, you know, um, tying the church into this, um, went to, got into Chicago, uh, found out that, um, um, I had to be part of what they called the Gregorian Masses. I believe they're called Gregorian Masses where it's 30 days and um, you'd have to sing part of it. Well, I was in, um, assigned to one week of doing out of those 30. It has to be consecutive. If it isn't, I guess you break it and then you have to start over. And there's a lot of money put into making sure that these Masses get said. Well, I'm, I'm there saying Mass and um, you know, um, I, I would say, the Lord be with you, and there would be no one in the church, but the Jesuit brother was walking around, and I'd hear from one corner in the church, he'd say, and also with you, and i think, you know, um, is this what, what the church is all about and what's happening? And then I helped out at a very poor parish, and the, the um, um, archdiocese was much more concerned about whether or not that church was paying its uh, uh, dues to the, to the diocese, and th there was just really no concern for the poor or for what was going on in the churches. So I did have to go through um, that period, and then in our early days, as we developed the community organization, it was what we called a neighborhood base. It was very issue intensive. Um, the church we utilized the church, but the church was not central to our work. And so after about 12 years of going through maybe what we might call the dark night, and um, the, um, we began to see that we needed to take a change in our organizing, and we did a listening campaign with the people that we were working with in the organization, and they started to bring me back. Uh, they, um, began to look at um, the importance of church in their lives, the importance of faith in their life, the importance of prayer, and how does what we're doing in the organizing as we're working um, and living out our values, how does that relate back to, how, how does our work relate back to our values? And that's part of being church. And so it, um, I reflected that how important it would be to be able to respond to those needs. And then it brought me back to my early days that I talked about how from the experience of the organizing, um, what a difference ma it made for my faith and what a difference it made for my theology. And so the um, starting to reflect back on that, um, the um, we developed um, the model of organizing that we do today, which is it's bringing those diverse groups of um, 
people in the community through uh, congregations of uh, many different congregations where these diverse groups can come together and um, it gives them an opportunity to put their faith into action. So, in summary, what I, I, I went through that transition from what theology led me to uh, community organizing and uh, to this day I, I am so grateful for the, the benefits and what I've received as a result of this as a ministry because it has strengthened my faith and it has strengthened my theology so much for the better. Thank you. Thank you, Father Bowman. That's really, uh, he's very modest about the accomplishments because Pico has organizations in so many different cities across this country and has had such an impact on all kinds of different communities in terms of health care and in terms of um, uh, reducing crime in various communities and connecting all kinds of different groups together. So it's, it's really quite an amazing success story. Thank you for, for being here and, and, and providing us a taste of, of your work. Um, next, we're going to hear from, there are, there are, as you may know, a number of um, networks across the United States that are involved in organizing like this. Um, about four of them, four or five that are really on a large, uh, a very large scale in this country. And certainly, PINKO is uh, among the, the largest in this, in the United States. Um, but in addition to PICO, there is also the Industrial Areas Foundation, which um, also has its roots in the work of Saul Alinsky. And uh, Mr. Larry Gordon, who is here with us today, is the, is the lead organizer for the affiliate of the IAF uh, here in Boston. And so I, I just um, uh, will be introducing him, and I want to say as I do so, that it's a, a, on a rare occasion that one gets the opportunity to introduce their husband. And um, I, I don't think that I've ever done this before. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I, I'm very excited to, um, to have the opportunity to introduce him. Uh, Larry began his organizing career in the civil rights movement in 1969, working with the National Wel Welfare Rights Organization. Larry has helped to build several broad-based and community organizations in Boston, in Providence, Rhode Island, and in California, in the cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Marin County. Larry has worked as an organizer in the labor movement as well, with the Service Employees International Union. In 1990, Larry began his association with the Industrial Areas Foundation, and has been an organizer with the IAF for the last 23 years. The IAF was founded in 1939 by, by the late Saul Alinsky. There are now 55 broad-based or community organization affiliates of the IAF in the United States, spread across 22 states and Washington, D.C. In addition, the IAF has affiliates in Great Britain, Australia, Germany, and Canada. Today, Larry is the lead organizer here of um, the affiliate in Boston, which is called the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, or GBIO. Uh, this broad-based organization is responsible for doing political work, um, the political work of bringing the health care reform in Massachusetts into being. So the fact that we have universal health care here in this state is largely um, the efforts of, of GBIO. And um, it has become, as you may know, with all the recent fights and, and the articles that we're reading and the news we're hearing about, um, this major fight on uh, federal affordable care, uh, which has often been dubbed in, in, uh, for years now as Obamacare. And it's largely modeled off, off of what happened here in the state of Massachusetts. Um, in addition, Larry supervises an, an IAF affiliate in Connecticut, which he was instrumental in, in bringing into um, being. And that affiliate is, is called Congregations Organized for a New Connecticut, or Congregaciones Organizadas para una Nueva Connecticut, or it's called CONNECT. And CONNECT organized and won an in-state tuition uh, fight um, to, to get into in-state tuition rates for immigrant students. It's the 11th state in the country to do so and the first in New England. 
Larry holds a law degree from the University of California Hastings College of Law. He practiced law for five years as an attorney in a California business law practice. He has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in American History from Brown University. And recently, he finished a book manuscript entitled Rediscovering Politics, Hannah Arendt, Market Ideology, and Democratic Practice. So please join me in, warming, in warmly welcoming Larry Gordon. It's a blessing and a privilege for me to be married to one of yours um, <laughs> here, uh, who, for whom it's not only a blessing for me, but I didn't appreciate her courage until today to let me loose on her stage. <laughs> so I hope we end up okay when this is done. Um, I also want to say a word about um, uh, Father John Bauman. I've known um, Father John since the mid-70s. And he is, um, he's a man who has dedicated himself to the poor for the whole of his professional career. Not only to the poor, but to this distinction between charity and justice, and has lived out a vocation and a mission of empowering the poor. Um, and uh, extraordinary dedicated service to the vocation, uh, in the best sense of that word, to the, to the priesthood. So I want to thank Father John for coming out here all the way from California to be, to be with us here in, in Boston. Some of the people who, who are really from Boston think that we're the hub, um, and the rest of the world emanates from us. And it's nice to have somebody from California uh, coming in and, and teaching us. Um, thanks, too, to Melinda Diamond, whose hard work made this possible, to Father Frechette, whose uh, vision created this, and to Dean Mark Massa, the School of Theology and Ministry, for, for hosting this. Um, I'd like to really talk. Uh, about, about two things in my remarks, and one of them uh, is, really to, is really off the insight that Father John spoke a little bit about today, but even spoke more about last night. It helped me to know how many, how many of, of us in the room were also heard his remarks last night. Okay, a few. Well, last night, <clears throat> Father John talked about the transition that he went through, he alluded to it again today, about how our work moved from being neighborhood focused, or you might even say, as he did last night, secular focused, to faith based, or church focused. And I would just like to reflect on that a bit and put that into a context that comes from, from my, my experience. And I'm going to begin it with, uh, with my parents. My mother, of blessed memory, may she rest in peace, um, grew up in a very violent context. Not, not inside her home violent, but she was born in the Deep South in central Georgia at a time when the Ku Klux Klan, which had been dormant for a couple decades, got revived. Um, and I meant to say, but I forgot, I'm, 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 not only am I not a theologian, um, I'm also not Catholic. Um, I'm glad to be here, uh, nevertheless, but I'm Jewish, and my parents were both Jewish. And this revival of the Klan happened around the lynching of a Jew in central Georgia. My father also grew up in a place where there was a lot of violence. My father, also Jewish, his people ended up landing in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And the Jews of Belfast tended to live in Northern Belfast. And Northern Belfast was a place where Protestants and Catholics weren't segregated by neighborhood. They were segregated by block. And when I went to visit uh, my father's homeland and the places where he lived, uh, many, many years later, you could still see the British turrets uh, 20, 25 feet up high with machine guns stationed 
to prevent people in alleyways, to prevent people in that neighborhood from going back and forth. It was a brutish violence, Protestant and Catholic, that he grew up with in all of his, all of his early years. When they finally made a life together in the United States and had to figure out how did they relate to a public arena here, they had completely opposite reactions. My father was bold. He was not afraid to step out. He was not afraid to speak up. My mother, in contrast, was terrified by public life, terrified that she or any of her loved ones would step up. Because what she believed deeply was, this is a very violent place. And when you step up here, the risks are too great. So great for her that when she was at the end of her teenage years and beginning to be out on her own, she changed her name to a non- her last name was Cohen, it was a very Jewish name. She changed her name because her approach to public life was hide, because that's the only place there's, there's safety. And over the years, as I've tried to get clear about why did they have such different reactions, while my father grew up in a place where you had to work hard to avoid the bullets that Catholics or the stones or the broken bottles between Catholics and Protestants, the Jews there had a thriving, fairly good-sized synagogue. And that synagogue operated for them as a cocoon. It had a protective shield around it. It was an institution that those folks felt like was a vehicle, not just felt like, it was a vehicle through which their interests were protected and were furthered. In fact, the Christian brothers of Belfast decided to go to the Jewish community and make a proposition that if you, the Jews, who are here are very, very poor, want to educate your kids, send them to our schools. That is to say, the Catholic school. That is to say, the private schools, because they're so much cheaper than the public school, i.e., the English school, i.e., the Protestant school. But the point was, they could go to a body politic that had a structure, that had leadership in it, through which to negotiate this result, that synagogue and that synagogue structure and leadership. And my father and all of that Jewish community were educated not by the public schools, but by the Christian brothers. My mother, who grew up in Cordell, Georgia, there were 12 Jewish families, that was it, there was no synagogue. There was no protective shield. There was no cocoon. And so the experience of public life was one of always vulnerability and risk. And so at a young age, it got internalized in me that these institutions matter. Because the large structures out there whether it's hundreds of years of conflict between the Irish and the British, or whether it's hundreds of years of racial conflagration in the South and in the rest of the country, the individual family has a great deal of difficulty contending with those forces out there. It needs something around it that's what in political theory are called mediating institutions that stand, that mediate in between individual families and larger structures. Now this has been around a long time, this idea of the importance of these institutions. In 1830, when Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman, an academic, a sociologist, visited the United States, his mission in the visit was to learn how, it, the United States then was what, 40, 45 years old. And the question was, how does this experiment work? And the, the old countries, the French, who didn't have the same level of, of institutional apparatus, sent him here to try to figure it out. How does this experiment work? 
and the less, how many of you have read Democracy in America? Okay, you should read it. Okay, it's a good book. He discovered and he argued in Democracy in America that the genius of this democracy is because they have something here called voluntary associations. It was important to him to use the word voluntary because unlike a lot of structures like that for him back home, nobody was forced to participate in these institutions. You chose to participate. Unlike a lot of Europe, the government didn't fund the church. You put in money into your church. You literally, or your synagogue or your mosque, you literally own it. And his conclusion was, that's why this democracy is working, because it's got a plethora of these different kinds of institutions through which people's interests can go into politics and can make a difference. So I and, and, and we in the IF think about these churches, synagogues, mosques, for some people, it's unions. For some people, it's fraternal associations. For some people, it's sisterhood associations. For some people, it's civic associations. It's wherever there's gatherings. And in this country, in our time, a most significant place of those gatherings happens to be religious institutions. They meet once a week. They may be very segregated, but they meet, but they meet once a week. And it's an already assemblage of people that works and through which you can you can organize. So while it's true that the values of these institutions help those of us who consider ourselves rooted in faith, it help, that helps us drive towards a more just world and we, we strive towards social justice. They also provide the function that you can't maintain a republic, you can't maintain a democracy unless you've got these thriving institutions. And those institutions, frankly, are under a lot of attack. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, in the IEF, we've committed ourselves to building our broad-based organizations inside of a context that helps to strengthen those kinds of, that fabric inside of our society. So that was one thing I wanted to talk about. The second thing I wanted to talk about is, it's also true that if you have what we call this institutional strategy, you have a greater likelihood of actually getting more power to deliver for the very poor and for the marginalized that we're trying to organize with. And one example that was alluded to by, by Nancy, occasionally we get to it, usually in our work, we're organizing and fighting to get to the negotiating table. Policy decisions, political decisions get made because deals get made at some table. The issue is who gets to be at the table when the deal gets made. And organizing is about can we make it a bigger table. That's what it is. <clears throat> Sometimes you actually get to the table and you get to stay there. And that's happened at GBIO because of what's happened around health care. We've been in it now for um, almost 10 years, so we have continuity and longevity. How am I doing on time, by the way? Is anybody paying attention? Yes, I am. You've got about seven minutes. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, in 1904, GBIO organized a campaign to try to get enough signatures on a petition that would put a radical reformation of health care on the ballot. It was a bit ironic because we wanted to get it rendered eligible for the ballot so that we could then pull it off the ballot and not have it go. It's a quirk. Massachusetts has funny rules and funny politics. Um, when you do a, a petition here to get something on a ballot, the first, I forget whether it's 15 or 20 or 25 people who sign, also have the authority to pull it. We didn't want it to go on the ballot because there'd be $10 million invested against us in a media campaign that we wouldn't have been able to contend with but we wanted to be able to threaten the legislature. And we started off with the House of Representatives. And we said to the speaker, after we did the work to get 55,000 signatures on the ballot, we went to the speaker and said, we're gonna drive this unless you will write a bill in the legislature to get legislation passed, and if you'll do that, 
we don't see a need to push the, to push the ballot initiative. And he was under, uh, I don't want to say a cloud, he later ended up in jail. Um, he was the third of three speakers of, of the House of Representatives in a row that's ended up in jail in, Ma in Massachusetts, but that was unrelated to this campaign around health care. Um, and at the time, it was early in his career. He wasn't being pursued yet by the authorities. And he, he took what we had for our petition, he, he rewrote it wrote, wrote, word for word, and that became the legislation. We then had a campaign to get that passed in the Senate. That was a tough campaign, but because we were going in with the leverage of already having it done in the House, we had, some, we had some leverage and we got it through the Senate. Then we had, and this is enormous irony, the, the then governor, whose name was Romney, to, to sign it. Um, it. Then later became in the Republican primary for the presidency, you know, Romney care. And he had to dodge and weave around it as if he was the main champion of it, which was interesting. Um, but in, 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 in his deciding to do it, the state, under the bidding of the insurance companies, said, we can't bring, we can't offer health insurance to whoever wants it. If we're going to do this, we have to mandate it. Meaning, in Massachusetts right now, if you don't get health insurance, you've broken the law. And we said, well, you can't, you can't do that. That criminalizes the poor. What about people that can't afford it? But the insurance company said, if we just do it wide open, people like me with white hair are going to sign up. And people like Jen Seuss Vassal, who's several years younger, and that age group and younger, they don't think they need health care. So we're going to get the sick, and we're not going to get the well. And so we're going to lose money on this. So everybody's got to be forced in. We made a political judgment that we couldn't fight that. We then entered into another two-year campaign where we established the affordability schedule in Massachusetts that says if someone can't afford it, here's the subsidy they're going to get to pay for it. So there's a huge subsidy that we built to make the mandate, it's called the individual mandate, make it work. That's another feature that got carried over into the federal, into the federal plan. Well, to make a long story short, in those days, we cut a deal that the insurance companies and the state and the hospital systems wanted, which was, let's fight to get more people health care insurance, but we're not going to talk about the question of cost of medical care. And we said, OK, we'll buy into that. Let's fight for access. And if we win, later on, we'll figure out whether we should go for the cost question. So we ran the campaign. We got the affordability schedule. We had all these relationships that were getting to get built with the insurance companies and the providers, da 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 And then, when the president essentially took the plan and federalized it and went with the Affordable Care Act, it became a point of vulnerability that the one place in the country that was already doing it happened to be the one place in the country where medical costs were higher than any other place. That's not a position that they like to be in. So pressure built up politically in the state particularly on the, to the Democrats, bring your costs down, for God's sake. And so the political party, the Democrats here, got very interested in trying to help with that. And they got the insurance companies and the providers to begin to think about some legislation. And usually, we're fighting to get to the table. And in this case, they came to us and said, would you get in it with us? Now, the reason they said, would you get in it with us was, notwithstanding the fact that we'd been pummeling them for four or five years to do the access fight and to do the affordability schedule, what they came to appreciate was it's an organized structure of consumers. On the one hand, they pummel us, but on the other hand, they'll cut a deal. Not just that they'll cut a deal, but they are organized enough that when they cut a deal, they will cut a deal that they will then be able to sell to the constituency that they're organizing. So we'll be able to say, the insurance companies want this, the hospitals can want this, state government wants this, and the public wants this. So here's the rub. When you get to two minutes, when you get to the table, 
and you're in what we call a partnership of governance, you end up operating a little differently. And you end up inside of a context that if a deal is going to be cut and you say you will agree with the deal, you've got to then go back and, and, and hopefully engage your constituency in a way that the deal will hold. A lot of the reasons why many of us avoid trying to get to a position of power is because unlike what it's like when you're outside fighting in, when you're a little bit inside, now you have some responsibility. And that's different. And that's always a context of, can you get a deal that's the best you can get, and is the best you can get something you can live with? And then you gotta go back and talk to your base and see if you can bring your base with you. Another reason why there's value in being inside of a structure that's got strong churches and strong mosques and strong synagogues and strong whatevers is that you now have an apparatus that can help you get a much broader consensus around the deal that you're trying to get. So for us, it was another opportunity in another arena of power where the importance and the strength of these kinds of mediating institutions is, is critical. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we do have really fun conversations over the dinner table. <laughs> um, thanks, Larry. Um, what I'd like to do is just to take a moment at your tables and um, just for you to think about what you've heard from Father John Bauman and his work with PICO and how that has really transformed his, his, respond, um, his own understanding of theology and justice and how that, that has transformed that. And then also what Larry has presented with regard to the work of the IAF and healthcare here and how it comes out of our own personal stories, the story of his mother and his father and, and their um, situations of violence. If you just take a moment and, and think about what, what it is that surprised you in what you heard, and, um, and if you would share that at your tables, and then I'm gonna ask both um, Father Bauman and, and, and Larry Gordon to be available to answer questions. So there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions, and we'll have a bit of a discussion before we take a, a break. So we'll take a few minutes at your tables to talk about that. What surprised you in what you heard? Questions that you have. Yes, please. And, and if you'd wait for a mic and introduce yourself, please, to us. Thank you. Um, I think that um, what Larry Gordon said about the importance of the uh, religious organization, church or synagogue, the faith-based organization, was, uh, has been my experience. But lately I've been thinking, it seems to be fading, oh, religious uh, organizations or people's connections to churches, to uh, synagogues, seems to be fading. Definitely in the Catholic Church, participation in weekly um, services is down completely. <laughs> you know, and we're a pay-as-you-go organization. We're not going to really exist much longer outside of theology. Um, but you know, on the ground, it's going to be very hard. So every once in a while lately, I've been been um, toying with the so what factor. You know? So what difference does it make that the church is here in Boston? So what if the church is here in Lowell? So what if there's an organization that works with interrelations among Catholic and Jewish and Muslim organizations? And I think I heard an answer here today, but, but do you see this, either of you, as a, um, an issue that needs to be addressed in a way that matters to the community outside of my own personal experience. Um, last evening, um, I used uh, different examples of um, like strengthening the local church. Um, in Pico, we do a lot of emphasis around a local congregation and um, through that congregation that reaches out not only to their to the people that worship in that congregation, but also beyond that congregation, and identify what are concerns um, and issues 
related to that um, community. Um, many uh, churches that I've seen, it can really strengthen the church because what it does, it will bring people into the church that said, um, I didn't realize I, I left the church because the church was not relating to what I considered the church to be about. And so um, that's where I've seen, seen the church itself being strengthened. And I think um, if the church related to the concerns of what's going on in the community, it's going to definitely strengthen church. And then what, what we do is pull together uh, leadership from the different faith traditions um, to identify something that is much larger and um, more difficult to achieve through one local congregation. And that's where we do in many of our organizations where we call it a federated gathering of where um, congregations come together, do spend a lot of time doing research on what the issue is, and then taking action, sitting down with whomever can change the situation. And so those can be around healthcare, a lot around school issues, uh, crime issues in the community, housing, those kinds of things. Uh, I would just add to that, um, I, I think you've named a very serious problem. Um, and, in a, you know, an example, um, Part of our work here in Boston has been about a uh, very serious organizing campaign around a middle school that's in the middle of the poorest, one of the poorest neighborhoods in town. Uh, the neighborhood is Roxbury, the school is the Dearborn School. That school has partnered up with a church that's in the organization. That church is much smaller than that school. Um, that school will become a member of the organization and when we approach that school, we try to imagine how could that school be a mediating institution? Not just a service operation to deliver some education to those young people. When I first came to Boston from California and was trying to get a sense here, I interviewed a bunch of um, principals in, in one particular neighborhood just to begin to get a fix. And two of the six that I, that I met with, one of them had a big table of hats in front of her office. And I walked in, I sat down with her, and I said, uh, what's with the hats? And she said, well, you know, it's Boston, it gets cold, we have tough winters, a lot of kids in this school are Caribbean, they don't know from hats, they lose their hats, so I go hustle hats. And I said, well, how much of your time uh, do you spend hustling hats? And she says, oh, I take two days out each semester, and I'm working the stores to, you know, to get my hats. Uh, 30 years ago, that's a conversation I would have been having with a pastor. I would not have been having that conversation with a school principal who wouldn't have seen herself as the place of hats of last resort for that, for that population. So as these churches gray and get older, um, uh, become more uh, established, if you will, the public schools in this country uh, are reaching a body politic that the churches don't reach in the same way. So we're not in the business of churches. We're in the business of mediating institutions of which churches are a part, but they might be a declining part. I hope not. When I say churches, I mean churches, synagogues, and mosques. But it's, a, it's an important question. Okay, another question. Leonard Campbell with Catholic Charities New Hampshire. And just a follow-up question then from your statement is that in our organizing then it's not about, our success is not going to be about the numbers, it's gonna be about being faithful, continuing to work towards the goals. So much of it um, is, uh, um, we have a principle, uh, organizing is about people, 
and people are about issues. And um, I think it is so important in what we do through the organizing to um, allow people the opportunity to be empowered so that uh, when they're empowered, they have the ability to act. And the, um, the issues are always going to be out there, but um, what is important is that people are empowered and so that they can um, tackle and handle those issues that are coming along in, in our communities. Other questions, sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Cooper. I'm a student at the STM. Um, we're having a little bit of a discussion at our, at our table about um, maybe where the most important place or the most effective place for communities of faith to kind of focus their efforts. Um, I was expressing some concern about um, focusing a lot of effort at a, at a really macro level for fear that, that that solution that's presented at that level might not meet the needs of the individual c communities. Um, and, um, and one of our table members talked about um, uh, a, a woman who had said the most effective place isn't necessarily at the grassroots level, but at the grass top level, kind of a mezzo, um, more neighborhood or, or regional level. Do you guys have any thoughts about, about where, you know, what level? Um, is it's most effective to work at? Well, in, in Pico, we put a lot of stress on three levels. Um, in, in the local community, uh, we start with local congregations um, to identify what are the concerns that are really very um, close to that congregation and to that neighborhood. Issues that um, that local church or local congregation is not able to deal with um, because it needs more strength. Um, that's when it's a coalition, or we call it a federation, of the congregations come together and move on that issue. Um, we've done a lot around schools uh, because one local congregation wouldn't be able to influence what's going on. Like, for example, in Oakland with some of these large schools broke them down into smaller schools, and it cut back, and then there was a lot of work with parents and parents uh, getting involved. Um, have done a lot around crime, a lot around housing at that level. Now in PICO, what we, we um, have looked at across the state when there are issues that are even bigger than what you can handle in your city, we pull together our organizations in a form statewide, and um, Again, this is a, a lot of time and energy spent with leadership coming together, leadership um, uh, building relationship with leadership so that they feel comfortable with the, each other, doing a lot of research together, and then um, sitting down with whomever uh, can make a change. And then um, from that experience, we've moved across nationally. Uh, we're in 19 states across the country. Um, so we have a lot of contact with local um, legislators. So we really push um, on some of the national issues that affect our families on the ground. And one in particular is immigration. We're a major, major push uh, that we're doing on immigration. I just had um, a text this morning that um, there was some, some real movement they felt that was coming out of the Congress, even though there's all this other stuff going on um, around the immigration. And so we're also uh, pushing around uh, health care at that level also. Um, so those are the levels that we work on. I, I think that's helpful and good advice. Uh, I think another an answer I would give to your question is you're both right. Um, I would, I would ask you to avoid the use of the word grassroots. A first church in Cambridge was formed in 1640. Old South Church in the organization was formed in about 1720. When we go into the talk to the mayor and he, call, he or she would call us grassroots, we'd say grassroots are very short. You were elected four years ago. My church was founded 350 years ago. Let's be clear about who's been here longer. So the, the, the term grassroots is a very insulting term, frankly, so try to stay away from it. 
Um, but <clears throat> there are times when you're, the, the real lesson in your question is you can't do everything at once. There are times where you've got to be up here. A lot of organizations fall into the trap of then staying there. What GBAO is doing, we've been in campaign after campaign after campaign for literally almost a decade. Uh, we're now going to say we're going to shut that down for a year. Not, not entirely shut it down, but radically reduce the kind of energy that gets. And we're going back completely inside all the congregations to do a reviving campaign about having hundreds and then thousands of conversations with people one-to-one -to, -one to reorganize what we've got. Now, GBIO has waited 10 years. You really should do that about every two or three. What you, what you find when you build something like this, once you get some wins, people get seduced and it becomes a, a drug. Let's just keep, let's just keep it going. And, and the leadership and the elders have to go, no, 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 we're gonna stop that, we're gonna go back and, re and, and rebuild the army before we go to war again. I shouldn't use maybe military analogies, but you have to do both. Can't do them both at once. Okay, so we'll take one more question and then, and then we'll move into a, um, a break. Okay, please. Uh -huh. So, uh, Diocese of Fall River. Uh, there's your two organizations that have the same roots. I'm hearing, uh, is there a difference in the way you both approach uh, community organizing? It's a loaded question. Oh, I, th I think, uh, would you say it's a culture uh, difference um, in um, how we've developed the organizing? Um, as I mentioned, um, um, Saul Alinsky had a lot of influence on me. We've made a radical change from the Alinsky method and um, probably what we hold to mainly are the, um, uh, you know, some of the principles that really guide our work, like um, Nancy had mentioned, uh, uh, don't do for others what people can do for themselves uh, and taking people where they are. Um, but uh, we made a, a major transition into, um, in PICO, that it's faith-based. And we, I don't know if IAF uses that terminology as much as we do. And um, so uh, we have a strong concentration on developing the organization through faith inst institutions. Um, now other institutions get involved. We partner with a lot of institutions. But we feel very strongly that the base in our cities needs to be through the congregations. And out of that strong base, then we're able to, to move forward. I think there's a lot more about how we're alike than how we're, than how we're different. Um, personally, um, where I come around some of these questions is, Part of what we're trying to do in our work is, is understand what it means to have pluralism. Um, and actually, I think that, that, that our presence makes their work better, and I think their presence makes our work better, and I think that's all a good thing. So we could have differences like, do we use the term faith-based as much as, or, or, or not? I think that um, when I say there's, we're more alike than different, um, if, if Alinsky was watching, uh, he'd be disgusted with both of us <laughs> because uh, he believed that you go to the, you go to the cardinal, you, you, get, you get some money, um, you go to the pastors, you ask them for their smartest 25 lay leaders, uh, and you say to the pastor, you won't hear from me again, but I, give me your best 25 and I'll, and I'll take them. And we've both experienced over our careers, you know, then you take those people out of those institutions and they get involved in making big changes and they start to like it, you know, but it doesn't necessarily reverberate back into the church or into the synagogue or into the mosque. GBIO has got 49 uh, institutions in it. I, 46 of them are churches, synagogues, or, or mosques. So we're all deeply rooted inside these institutions, but they've become the center of the, of the broad-based organization, whereas in Alinsky's day, they were peripheral, structurally they were peripheral. And that's the big, that's the big shift, is to an institutional strategy. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to need to take a break, but perhaps you could join me in thanking both of our presenters and for their great wisdom.